This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam by Douglas Murray in 2017. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or visit my website for downloads. Introduction Europe is committing suicide, or at least its leaders have decided to commit suicide. Whether the European people choose to go along with this is naturally another matter. When I say that Europe is in the process of killing itself, I do not mean that the burden of European Commission regulation has become overbearing, or that the European Convention on Human Rights has not done enough to satisfy the demands of a particular community. I mean that the civilization we know as Europe is in the process of committing suicide, and that neither Britain nor any other Western European country can avoid that fate because we all appear to suffer from the same symptoms and maladies. As a result, by the end of the lifespans of most people currently alive, Europe will not be Europe, and the peoples of Europe will have lost the only place in the world we had to call home. Okay, weird. It may be pointed out that the proclamations of Europe's demise have been a staple throughout our history, and that Europe would not be Europe without regular predictions of our mortality. Yet some have been more persuasively timed than others. In Die Welt von Gestern, or The World of Yesterday, first published in 1942, Stefan Zweig wrote of his continent in the years leading up to the Second World War, quote, I felt that Europe in its state of derangement had passed its own death sentence. Our sacred home of Europe, both the cradle and the Parthenon of Western civilization, end quote. One of the few things that gave Zweig any hope, even then, was that in the countries of South America, to which he had finally fled, he saw offshoots of his own culture. <clears throat> in Argentina and Brazil, he witnessed how a culture can emigrate from one land to another, so that even if the tree that gave the culture life has died, it can still provide new blossom and new fruit. Even had Europe at that moment destroyed itself completely, Zweig felt that the consolation that what generations had done before us was never entirely lost. Today, largely because of the catastrophe Zweig described, the tree of Europe is finally lost. Europe today has little desire to reproduce itself, fight for itself, or even take its own side in an argument. Those in power seem persuaded that it would not matter if the people and culture of Europe were lost to the world. Some have clearly decided, as Bertolt Brecht wrote in his 1953 poem, The Solution, to dissolve the people and elect another because, as a recent Swedish conservative prime minister, Frederick Reinfeldt, put it, only barbarism comes from countries like his, whereas only good things come from the outside. There is no single cause of the present sickness. The culture produced by the tributaries of Judeo-Christian culture, the ancient Greeks and Romans, and the discoveries of the Enlightenment has, been, has not been leveled by nothing. But the final act has come about because of two simultaneous concatenations from which it is now all but impossible to recover. The first is the mass movement of peoples into Europe. In all Western European countries, the process began after the Second World War due to labor shortages. Soon, Western got hooked on the migration and could not stop the flow even if it wanted to. The result was that what had been Europe, the home of the European peoples, gradually became a home for the entire world. The places that had been European gradually became somewhere else. So places dominated by Pakistani immigrants resembled Pakistan in everything but their location, with the recent arrivals and their children eating the food of their place of origin, speaking the language of their place of origin, and worshipping the religion of their place of origin. Streets in the cold and rainy northern towns of Europe filled with people dressed for the foothills of Pakistan or the sandstorms of Arabia. The Empire Strikes Back noted some observers with a barely concealed smirk. Yet, whereas the empires of Europe had been thrown off, these new colonies were obviously intended to be for good. All the time, Europeans found ways to pretend this could work. By insisting, for instance, that such immigration was normal, or that if integration did not happen with the first generation, then it might happen with their children, grandchildren, or another generation yet to come. Or that it didn't matter whether people integrated or not. All the time we waved away the greater likelihood that it just wouldn't work. 
This is a conclusion that the migration crisis of recent years has simply accelerated. Which brings me to the second concatenation. For even the mass movement of millions of people into Europe would not sound such a final note for the continent were it not the fact that, coincidentally or otherwise, at the same time Europe lost faith in its beliefs, its traditions, and its own legitimacy. Countless factors have contributed to this development, but one is the way in which Western Europeans have lost what the Spanish philosopher Miguel de Amuno, Unamuno famously called the tragic sense of life. They have forgotten what Zweig and his generation so painfully learned, that everything you love, even the greatest and most cultured civilizations in history, can be swept away by people who are unworthy of them. Other than simply ignoring it, one of the few ways to avoid this tragic sense of life is to push it away through a belief in the tide of human progress. That tactic remains for the time being the most popular approach. Yet all the time we skate over and sometimes fall into terrible doubts of our own creation. More than any other continent or culture in the world today, Europe is now deeply weighed down with guilt for its past. Alongside this outgoing version of self-distrust runs a more introverted version of the same guilt. For there is also the problem in Europe of an existential tiredness and a feeling that perhaps for Europe the story has run out and a new story must be allowed to begin. Mass immigration, the replacement of large parts of the European populations by other people, is one way in which this new story has been changed, a change we seem to think was as good as a rest. Such existential civilizational tiredness is not a uniquely modern European phenomenon, but the fact that a society should feel like it has run out of steam at precisely the moment when a new society has begun to move in cannot help but lead to vast epochal changes. Had it been possible to discuss these matters, some solution might have been reached. Yet even in 2015, at the height of the migration crisis, it was speech and thought that was constricted. At the height of the crisis in September 2015, Chancellor Merkel of Germany asked the Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg what could be done to stop European citizens writing criticisms of her migration policy on Facebook. Are you working on this? She asked him. He assured her that he was. In fact, the criticism, thought, and discussion ought to have been boundless. Looking back, it is remarkable how restricted we made our discussion even whilst we opened our home to the world. A thousand years ago, the peoples of Genoa and Florence were not as intermingled as they are now, but today they are all recognizably Italian, and tribal differences have tended to lessen rather than grow with time. The current thinking appears to be that at some stage in the years ahead, the peoples of Eritrea and Afghanistan will too be intermingled within Europe as the Genoans and Florentines are now melded into Italy. The skin color of individuals from Eritrea and Afghanistan may be different, their ethnic origins may be from further afield, but Europe will still be Europe, and its people will continue to mingle in the spirit of Voltaire and St. Paul, Dante, Goethe, and Bach. As with so many popular delusions, there is something in this. The nature of Europe has always shifted, and as trading cities like Venice show, has included a grand and uncommon receptiveness to foreign ideas and influence. From the ancient Greeks and Romans onwards, the people of Europe sent out ships to scour the world and report back on what they found. Rarely, if ever, did the rest of the world return this curiosity in kind, but nevertheless the ships went out and returned with tales and discoveries that melded into the air of Europe. The receptivity was prodigious. It was not, however, boundless. The question of where the boundaries of the culture lay is endlessly argued over by anthropologists and cannot be solved. But there were boundaries. Europe was never, for instance, a continent of Islam. Yet, aware that, yet the awareness that our culture is constantly, subtly changing has deep European roots. The philosophers of ancient Greece understood the conundrum, summing it up most famously in the paradox of the ship of Theseus. As recorded in Plutarch, the ship in which Theseus had sailed had been preserved by the Athenians, who put in new timber when parts of the ship decayed. Yet, was this not still the ship of Theseus, even when it consisted of none of the materials in which he had sailed? We know that the Greeks today are not the same people as the ancient Greeks. We know that the English are not the same today as they were a millennium ago, 
nor the French the French. And yet they are recognizably Greek, English, and French, and all are European. In these and other identities, we recognize a degree of cultural succession, a tradition that remains with certain qualities, positive as well as negative, and customs and behaviors. We recognize the great movements of the Normans, the Franks, and the Gauls, and that these brought about great changes. And we know from history that some movements affect a culture, a culture relatively little in the long term, whereas others can change it irrevocably. The problem comes not with an acceptance of change, but with the knowledge that when those changes come too fast or are too different, we become something else, including something we may never have wanted to be. At the same time, we are confused over how this is meant to work. While generally agreeing that it is possible for an individual to absorb a particular culture, given the right degree of enthusiasm both from the individual and the culture, whatever their skin color, we know that we Europeans cannot become whatever we like. We cannot become Indian or Chinese, for instance, and yet we are expected to believe that anyone in the world can move to Europe and become European. If being European is not about race, as we hope it is not, then it is even more imperative that it is about values. This is what makes the question, what are European values, so important. Yet this is another debate about which we are wholly confused. Are we, for instance, Christian? In the 2000s, this debate had a focal point in the row over the wording of the new EU constitution and the absence of any mention of the continent's Christian heritage. Pope John Paul II and his successor tried to rectify the omission. As the former wrote in 2003, quote, while fully respecting the secular nature of the institutions, I wish once more to appeal to those drawing up the future European constitutional treaty so that it will include a reference to the religious and in particular the Christian heritage of Europe, end quote. The debate did not only divide Europe geographically and politically, it also pointed to a glaring aspiration. For religion had not only retreated in, in Western Europe, in its wake there arose a desire to demonstrate that in the 21st century Europe had a self-supporting structure of rights, laws, and institutions, which could exist even without the source that had arguably given them life. Like Kant's dub, we wondered whether we wouldn't be able to fly faster if we lived in free air, without the bother, the bother of the wind keeping us aloft. Much rested on the success of this dream. In the place of religion came the ever-inflating language of human rights, itself a concept of Christian origin. We left unresolved the question of whether or not our acquired rights were reliant on beliefs that the continent had ceased to hold, or whether they existed of their own accord. This was, at the very least, an extremely big question to have left unresolved, while vast new populations were being expected to integrate. An equally significant question erupted at the same time around the position and purpose of the nation-state. From the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 up to the late 20th century, the nation-state in Europe had generally been regarded not only as the best guarantor of constitutional order and liberal rights, but the ultimate guarantor of peace. Yet this certainty also eroded. Central European figures like Chancellor Kohl of Germany in 1996 insisted that, quote, the nation-state cannot solve the great problems of the 21st century, end quote. Disintegration of the nation-states of Europe into one large integrated political union was so important, Cole insisted, that it was in fact a question of war and peace in the 21st century. Others disagreed, and 20 years later, just over half of the British people demonstrated at the ballot box that they were unpersuaded by Cole's argument. But once again, whatever one's views on the matter, this was a huge question to leave unresolved at a time of vast population change. While unsure of ourselves at home, we made final efforts at extending our values abroad. Yet whenever our governments and armies got involved in anything in the name of these human rights, such as Iraq in 2003 or Libya in 2011, we seemed to make things worse and ended up in the wrong. When the Syrian civil war began, people cried for Western nations to intervene in the name of the human rights that were undoubtedly being violated. But there was no appetite to protect such rights, because whether or not we believed in them at home, we had certainly lost faith in our ability to advance them abroad.
at some stage, it became it began to seem impossible to advance um, possible. It began to seem possible that what had been called the last utopia, the first universal system that divorced the rights of man from the say of gods or tyrants, might compromise a final failed European aspiration. If that is indeed the case, then it leaves Europeans in the 21st century without any unifying idea capable of ordering the present or approaching the future. At any time, the loss of all unifying stories about our past or ideas about what to do with our present or future would be a serious conundrum. But during a time of momentous societal change and upheaval, the results are proving fatal. The world is coming into Europe at precisely the moment that Europe has lost sight of what it is. And while the, mil the movement of millions of people from other cultures into a strong and assertive culture might have worked, the movement of millions of people into a guilty, jaded, and dying culture cannot. Even now, Europe's leaders talk of, a, of an invigorated effort to incorporate the millions of new arrivals. These efforts, too, will fail. In order to incorporate as large and wide a number of people as possible, it is necessary to come up with a definition of inclusion that as, is as wide and unobjectionable as possible. If Europe is going to become a home for the world, it must search for a definition of itself that is wide enough to encompass the world. This means that in the period before this aspiration collapses, our values become so wide as to become meaninglessly shallow. So whereas European identity in the past could be attributed to highly specific, not to mention philosophically and historically deep foundations, such as the rule of law, the ethics derived from the continent's history and philosophy, today, the ethics and beliefs of Europe, indeed the identity and ideology of Europe, have, have become about respect, tolerance, and most self-abnegating of all diversity. Such shallow definitions may get us through a few more years, but they have no chance at all of being able to call on the deeper loyalties that societies must be able to reach if they are going to survive for long. This is just one reason why it is likely that our European culture, which has lasted all these centuries and shared with the world such heights of human achievement, will not survive. As recent elections in Austria and the rise of Alternative for Deutschland seem to prove, while the likelihood of cultural erosion remains irresistible, the options for cultural defense continue to be unacceptable. Stefan Zweig was right to recognize the derangement and right to recognize the death sentence that the cradle and Parthenon of Western civilization had passed upon itself. Only his timing was out. It would take several more decades before that sentence was carried out, by ourselves, on ourselves. Here, in the in-between years, instead of remaining a home for the European peoples, we have decided to become a utopia, only in the original Greek sense of the word, to become no place. This book is an account of that process. The research and writing of this book have taken me across a continent I have traveled well for years, but often to parts I might otherwise not have visited. Over the course of several years, I traveled from the most southeasterly islands of Greece in the, most, in the southernmost outposts of Italy to the heart of northern Sweden in countless suburbs of France, Holland, Germany, and more. During the writing, I have had the opportunity to speak with many members of the public, as well as politicians and policymakers from across the political spectrum, border guards, intelligence agencies, NGO workers, and many others on the front line. In many ways, the most instructive part of my research has been speaking to Europe's newest arrivals, people who sometimes literally arrived yesterday. On the reception islands of southern Europe and across the places they stay or settle on their way north, all have their own stories, and many have their own tragedies. All see Europe as a place where they can live, where they can best live their lives. Those willing to talk and share their stories were necessarily a self-selecting group. There were times, lingering outside a camp in the evening, when people emerged or returned who seemed, to say the least, not to be approaching our continent in the spirit of generosity or gratitude. But many others were exceptionally friendly and grateful for an opportunity to get their stories out. Whatever my own views on the situations that brought them here and our continent's response, our conversations always concluded with me saying the only thing that, to them that I honestly could say without caveat, good luck. Thank you for watching. Please like, 
subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.